What I'm going to do now, and uh, we don't really have the time for the algebra, but a lot of it is very consistent with what we've already observed at the ellipse. Um, I'm just going to show you like what are the, the bits that make this thing work. Okay. So this, like we saw before, has an almost identical equation to the ellipse, with the exception of that minus sign. That minus sign sort of changes everything. Okay. Now, I want you to have a look at some of the features that you notice, right? For this particular hyperbola, which is oriented horizontally, we always start out with the horizontal case because the x's are easier to deal with. Um, how do I get the intercepts? Do you remember how I got the intercepts? These two here? I let y equal 0, right? Like so. So that's why this guy vanishes. Now that you think in general terms, I'm not going to get plus or minus 2, I think, which is what I got there. What are these values in algebraic terms? They're going to come from here, right? You're going to be solving x squared equals a squared. So your solutions are plus or minus a. So here's a and negative a. Okay. Now you've got your focus, foci rather, over here and over here. Okay. And then you also have your directrices. Something like this. Okay. Now, just like with the ellipse, you can make some pretty fancy geometric arguments. It's the library. Um, to determine, okay, well, in terms of my a and my b, where is everything? Okay. Now, I'm not going to rehearse that for you. You can attempt it. It's not difficult. But one of the reasons why I'm excluding it is because you'll be very, very, very disappointed when you get to the end. Because, either disappointed or happy, because the coordinates of the foci for an, a hyperbola are exactly the same as the coordinates for the foci on an ellipse. That's kind of a relief. And it's exactly the same thing with the directrices. Okay? So thankfully, we do not need to remember more <laughs> equations that those coordinates for the foci are always the coordinates for the foci and the same for the directrices. Okay? But that's not all there is to it. Okay? Um, you might remember on the ellipse there are axes of symmetry. You remember that? There are also axes of symmetry here, but you can't really say like there's a long one and a short one, right? Because well, where are the axes of symmetry? X and Y. They're on the coordinate axes, right? So I can label in, okay, colors don't count in there. I can label in this axis here. Now, because this is an axis that happens when you cross from one branch of the hyperbola over to the other, right? When you cross over, what they do is they call this not the major or minus, they call this the transverse axis. The transverse axis, because you're crossing, that's what transverse means, from one over to the other. Okay? Now there's another axis, but like it doesn't have a length or anything. So that's why the major minor categories don't, don't really make sense. Okay? Now noting that the transverse axis goes from minus a to a, which is exactly like it is in the ellipse, where do you think they'll put the other axis? Instead of minus a to a? They're going to put it from minus b to b. Okay? So if I have minus b here, and be here. I know it's going to be smaller. Okay. I've got this line now, and this is really hilarious. Okay. Most of the time in mathematics, you think that names are really effectively and meaningfully, like eccentricity. It's a great name. No one could really come up with a great name for this. So therefore, I'm going to, instead of calling it the transverse, transverse axis, they call it the conjugate, conjugate axis. Now, what does conjugate mean? Minus or <laughs> down. Conjugate kind of means, you know, the other one, right? It's like in a pair, you've got two things. There's one thing and it's conjugate, right? One thing, conjugate. Wherever you've got pairs of anything, like axes, a conjugate to me just means the other one, right? So transverse has a meaning. You cross between the branches. Conjugate just means it's not that one, okay? So what, um, Okay, so what changes between these is exactly the same as what happens, what changes on the ellipse, right? As A gets bigger, right, these are going to get further and further apart. Does that make sense? The foci are also going to get further apart. As B gets bigger, it stretches out this way. So you're changing the proportions of this thing, okay? Now I'm going to give you a great animation that shows you the effect of this in a second. Now one last quick thing. If you go all the way back to the beginning, and instead of going with actual numbers, you go with um, A's and E's and B's. To derive this, right, you go all the way through just like you did with the herbs, with one exception, you end up with this. It's a 
very subtle difference. Do you remember we did this? Everything from the foci, the directories you see, was in terms of A's and E's, A's and E's, and that's why you've only got A's and E's here, there are no B's, right? And then you look at this thing and you say, oh, well that must be B squared. It must be B squared, right? But look, make a really careful note. It is so subtly different. What's the subtle difference? Ah. These guys are swapped. These guys are swapped. And there's a reason why they're swapped. Why do they have to swap? Why? Because the eccentricity has to be bigger than one, right? You can see it right there. If the eccentricity is smaller than one, you're going to get a circle, an ellipse, or a parabola. But if it's bigger than one, you can't have one minus e squared. It's going to break down. You're going to get a square which has to be negative, and we just saw that broke down. So you get a different relationship here for the hyperbola versus the others. Okay. When you're finding the features, you punch this in instead of 1 minus e squared, and everything else is the same. Finding the foci is the same. Finding the directrices are the same. OK, now it's almost the moment to pack up. And I'm just, I've saved the best last, I promise. Four, count them, one, two, three, four, different shapes that emerge on various values of eccentricity. Four shapes, right? What is the actual thing binding these? And thankfully, here the name is going to come to the rescue. So I'm going to What is an ellipse? This is an ellipse. Can you look at it? Can you see? There's the ellipse in there. Now, where an ellipse actually comes from is that you take a cone and you slice across it. Right? In other words, you take the section, a cross section, right? and this is the shape that emerges. Okay? You can see the ellipse. Can you see the horizons? Right? There's another way. Actually, there are many other ways you can cut a cone. For example, how would I cut this cone to get not an ellipse, but a circle? How would I cut it? Just go straight across and make sure it's straight across. That's the only way you'll get an exact circle. Any angle and you'll get this ellipse kind of shape. Right? Circle, ellipse. How would I cut this thing to get this? And the answer is, I just take that shape, the same cone, and I go steeper. But not just any amount steeper, a very, very specific value of steepness. Namely, look at it closely, I'll try and point it towards you so you can see. Have a look at the cone, have a look at the edge of the cone, this thing that I've got my hand on right now. Do you see the relationship between my hand oh, it's and exactly that cone? The same. It's exactly parallel to the slant height. And that and only that gives you the parabola. If you cut a bit too off, like a bit too steep, right? You don't get a parabola anymore. You get these guys, right? You see, because of the way I've cut it, you don't get one piece, like I've got with all of these guys. One, two, three. They're all made of one piece. This is not made of one piece. It's made of two, because you've got another part of the cone that you inadvertently cut, and that's how you get this shape. That's what it's called. Now, one more thing. Please bear with me. Here, here are these beautiful shapes. Okay? These are the conic, conic sections. They've been cut across, and that's where these shapes emerge from, right? <laughs> Believe me, it's been so hard to not say conic sections and talking about this. Because this is where they come from, right? And you can see, if I muck about with this thing, right? If I muck about with this, have a look, I'm going to have to stand up. Oh, no, I'm just going to stand here. If I muck about, you see, I get circles of various size, or I would get ellipses of various size. Or maybe I would get, okay, I've got to nail this, hold on, hold on. No, not too far. Uh, there it is. I would get, I, I need to move this around, sorry. There we go. I would get hyperbolas, uh, sorry, parabolas of different sizes, right? And lastly, if I go steep enough, uh, this way, there we go. I'm going to get, let's move this around a little you can see I get I hyperbola at different spots like that. Uh, wait, what's the time? Uh, 